Volume 2, Chapter 17 of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 2, Chapter 17 Challenge and Response. Time passed, like a ship across a distant horizon which moves but which does not seem to move. One Monday evening, Edwin said that he was going round to Lane End House. He had been saying so for weeks and hesitating. He thoroughly enjoyed going to Lane End House. There was no reason why he should not go frequently and regularly, and there were several reasons why he should. Yet his visitings were capricious, because his nature was irresolute. That night he went, sticking a hat carelessly on his head and his hands deep into his pockets. Down the slope of Trafalgar Road, in the biting November mist, between the two rows of gas-lamps that flickered feebly into the pale gloom, came a long, straggling band of men, who also, to compensate for the absence of overcoats, stuck hands deep into pockets, and strode quickly. With reluctance they divided for the passage of the steam-car, and closed, growling together, again on its rear. The potters were on strike, and a bursty contingent was returning in embittered silence from a mass-meeting at Hambridge. When the sound of the steam-car subsided, as the car dipped over the hilltop on its descent towards Hambridge, Nothing could be heard but the tramp, tramp of the procession on the road. Edwin hurried down the side street, and in a moment rang at the front door of the Orgreaves. He nodded familiarly to the servant who opened, stepped onto the mat, and began contorting his legs in order to wipe the edge of his boot soles. "'Quite a stranger, sir,' said Martha bridling, and respectfully aware of her attractiveness for this friend of the house. "'Yes,' he laughed. "'Anybody in?' "'Well, sir, I'm afraid Miss Janet and Miss Alicia are out.' "'And Mr. Tom?' "'Mr. Tom's out, sir. He pretty nearly always is now, sir.' The fact was that Tom was engaged to be married, and the servant indicated, by a scarcely perceptible motion of the chin, that fiancés were, and ever would be, all the same. "'And Mr. John and Mr. James are out, too, sir.' They also were usually out. They were both assisting their father in business, and sought relief from his gigantic conception of a day's work by evening diversions at Hanbridge. These two former noisy liberals had joined the Hanbridge Conservative Club because it was a club and had a billiard table that could only be equalled at the Five Towns Hotel at Knipe. Uh, and Mr. Orgreave? He's working upstairs, sir. Mrs. Orgreave's got her asthma, and so he's working upstairs. Well, tell them I've called. Edwin turned to depart. I'm sure Mr. Orgreave would like to know you're here, sir, said the maid firmly. "'If you just step into the breakfast-room.' "'That may did as she chose with visitors for whom she had a fancy. Two. "'She conducted him to the so-called breakfast-room and shut the door on him. "'It was a small chamber behind the drawing-room and shabbier than the drawing-room. "'In earlier days the children had used it for their lessons and hobbies, "'and now it was used as a sitting-room when mere cosiness was demanded by a decimated family. "'Edwin stooped down and mended the fire. Then he went to the wall and examined a framed water-colour of the old Sitch pottery, which was signed with his initials. He had done it, aided by a photograph, and by Johnny Orgreave in details of perspective, and by dint of preprandial frequentings of the Sitch, as a gift for Mrs. Orgreave. It always seemed to him to be rather good. Then he bent to examine bookshelves. Like the hall, the drawing-room, and the dining-room, this apartment, too, was plenteously full of everything, and littered over with the apparatus of various personalities. Only from habit did Edwin glance at the books. He knew their backs by heart. And books in quantity no longer intimidated him. Despite his grave defects as a keeper of resolves, despite his paltry trick of picking up a newspaper or periodical and reading it all through, out of sheer vacillation and mental sloth, before starting serious perusals, despite the human disinclination which he had to bracing himself and keeping up the tension in a manner necessary for the reading of long and difficult works, and despite sundry ignominious backslidings into original sluggishness, still he had accomplished certain literary adventures. He could not enjoy Don Juan. Expecting from it a voluptuous and daring grandeur, he had found in it nothing whatever that even roughly fitted into his idea of what poetry was, but he had had a passion for Child Harold, many stanzas of which thrilled him again and again, 
bringing back to his mind what Hilda Lesways had said about poetry. And further, he had a passion for Voltaire. In Voltaire also he had been deceived, as in Byron he expected something violent, arid, closely argumentative, and he found gaiety, grace, and really the funniest jokes. He could read Candide almost without a dictionary, and he had intense pride in doing so, and for some time afterwards Candide and La Princesse de Babylone, and a few similar witty trifles, were the greatest stories in the world for him. Only a faint reserve in Tom Orgreave's responsive enthusiasm made him cautiously reflect. He could never be intimate with Tom, because Tom somehow never came out from behind his spectacles. But he had learnt much from him, and in especial a familiarity with the less difficult of Bach's preludes and fugues, which Tom loved to play. Edwin knew not even the notes of music, and he was not sure that Bach gave him pleasure. Bach affected him strangely. He would ask for Bach out of a continually renewed curiosity, so that he could examine once more, and yet again, the sensations which the music produced. And the habit grew. As regards the fugues, there could be no doubt that, the fugue had begun, a desire was thereby set up in him for the resolution of the confusing problem created in the first few bars, and that he waited, with a pleasant and yet a trying anxiety, for the indications of that resolution, and that the final reassuring and utterly tranquillizing chords gave him deep joy. When he innocently said that he was glad when the end came of a fugue, all the Orgreaves laughed heartily, but after laughing Tom said that he knew what Edwin meant, and quite agreed. 3. It was while he was glancing along the untidy and crowded shelves with sophisticated eye that the door brusquely opened. He looked up mildly, expecting a face familiar, and saw one that startled him, and heard a voice that aroused disconcerting vibrations in himself. It was Hilda Lesways. She had in her hand a copy of The Signal. Over fifteen months had gone since their last meeting, but not since he had last thought of her. Her features seemed strange. His memory of them had not been reliable. He had formed an image of her in his mind, and had often looked at it, and he now saw that it did not correspond with the reality. The souvenir of their brief intimacy swept back upon him. Incredible that she should be there, in front of him, and yet there she was. More than once, after reflecting on her, he had laughed, and said lightly to himself, "'Well, the chances are that I shall never see her again. Funny girl!' But the recollection of her gesture with Mr. Shushan's prevented him from dismissing her out of his head with quite that lightness. "'I'm ordered to tell you that Mr. Orgreave will be down in a few minutes,' she said. Hello, he exclaimed. "'I'd no idea you were in Bursley.' "'Came to-day,' she replied. "'How odd,' he thought, "'that I should call like this on the very day she comes.' But he pushed away that instinctive thought, with the rational thought that such a coincidence could not be regarded as in any way significant. They shook hands in the middle of the room, and she pressed his hand, while looking downwards with a smile. And his mind was suddenly filled with the idea that during all those months she had been existing somewhere, under the eye of someone, intimate with someone, and constantly conducting herself with a familiar freedom that doubtless she would not use to him. And so she was invested, for him, with mysteriousness. His interest in her was renewed in a moment, and in a form much more acute than its first form. Moreover, she presented herself to his judgment in a different aspect. He could scarcely comprehend how he had ever deemed her habitual expression to be forbidding. In fact, he could persuade himself now that she was beautiful, and even nobly beautiful. From one extreme he flew to the other. She sat down on an old sofa. He remained standing. And in the midst of a little conversation about Mrs. Orgreave's indisposition and the absence of the members of the family, she said she had refused an invitation to go with Janet and Alicia to Hillport, she broke the thread and remarked, "'You would have known I was coming if you'd been calling here recently.' She had pushed her feet near the fender and gazed into the fire. "'Ah, but you see, I haven't been calling recently.' She raised her eyes to his. "'I suppose you've never thought about me once since I left?' She fired at him. "'An audacious and discomposing girl!' "'Oh, 
Yes, I have, he said weakly. What could he reply to such speeches? Nevertheless, he was flattered. Really? But you never inquired about me? Yes, I have. Only once. How do you know? I asked Janet. Damn her, he said to himself, but pleased with her. And aloud, in a tone suddenly firm, That's nothing to go by. What isn't? The number of times I've inquired. He was blushing. 4. In the smallest of the rooms, sitting as it were at his feet on the sofa, surrounded and encaged by a hundred domestic objects and by the glow of the fire and the radiance of the gas, she certainly did seem to Edwin to be an organism exceedingly mysterious. He could follow with his eye every fold of her black dress, he could trace the waving of her hair, and watch the play of light in her eyes. He might have physically hurt her, he might have killed her, she was beneath his hand, and yet she was most bafflingly withdrawn, and the essence of her could not be touched or got at. Why did she challenge him by her singular attitude? Why was she always saying such queer things to him? No other girl, he thought in the simplicity of his inexperience, would ever talk as she talked. He wanted to test her by being rude to her. Damn her, he said to himself again. Supposing I took hold of her and kissed her? I wonder what sort of a face she'd pull then. And a moment ago he'd been appraising her as nobly beautiful. A moment ago he had been dwelling on the lovely compassion of her gesture with Mr. Shushens. This quality of daring and naughty enterprise had never before shown itself in Edwin, and he was surprised to discover in himself such impulses. But then the girl was so provocative, and somehow the sight of the girl delivered him from an excessive fear of consequences. He said to himself, "'I'll do something, or I'll say something, before I leave her to-night, just to show her.' He screwed up his resolution to the point of registering a private oath that he would indeed do or say something. Without a solemn oath he could not rely upon his valour. He knew that whatever he said or did in the nature of a bold advance would be accomplished clumsily. He knew that it would be unpleasant. He knew that inaction suited much better his instinct for tranquillity. No matter. All that was naught. She had challenged, and he had to respond. Besides, she allured and after her scene with him in the porch of the new house, had he not the right? A girl who had behaved as she did that night cannot effectively contradict herself. "'I was just reading about this strike,' she said, rustling the newspaper. "'You've soon got into local politics.' "'Well,' she said, "'I saw a lot of the men as we were driving from the station. I should think I saw two thousand of them. So, of course, I was interested. I made Mr. Orgreave tell me all about it. "'Will they win?' It depends on the weather. He smiled. She remained silent and grave. I see, she said, leaning her chin on her hand. At her tone he ceased smiling. She said, I see, and she actually had seen. You see, he repeated, if it was June instead of November, <laughs> but then it isn't June. Wages are settled every year in November. So if this to be a strike, it can only begin in November. "'But didn't the men ask for the time of year to be changed?' "'Yes,' he said. "'But you don't suppose the masters were going to agree to that, do you?' He sneered masculinely. "'Why not?' "'Because he gives them such a pull.' "'What a shame!' Hilda exclaimed passionately. "'And what a shame it is that the masters want to make the wages depend on selling prices. "'Can't they see that selling prices ought to depend on wages?' Edwin said nothing. She had knocked suddenly out of his head all ideas of flirting, and he was trying to reassemble them. "'I suppose you're like all the rest?' she questioned gloomily. "'I'll oh, like all the rest. Against the men. Mr. Orgreaves lives, and he says your father is very strongly against them.' "'Look here,' said Edwin, with an air of resentment, as to which he himself could not have decided whether it was assumed or genuine. "'What earthly right have you to suppose that I'm like all the rest?' "'I'm very sorry,' she surrendered. "'I knew all the time you weren't.' With her face still bent downwards, she looked up at him, smiling sadly, smiling roguishly. "'Father's against them,' he proceeded, somewhat deflated. 
and he thought of all his father's violent invective, and of Maggie's bland acceptance of the assumption that workmen on strike were rascals. How different the excellent, simple Maggie from this feverish creature on the sofa! Father's against them, and most people are, because they broke the last arbitration award. But I'm not my father. If you ask me, I'll tell you what I think. Workmen on strike are always in the right, at bottom, I mean. You've only got to look them in a crowd together. They don't starve themselves for fun. He was not sure he was convinced of the truth of these statements, but she drew them out of him by her strange power. And when he had uttered them, they appeared fine to him. "'What does your father say to that?' "'Oh,' said Edwin uneasily, "'him and me, we, we don't argue about these things.' "'Why not?' "'Well, we don't.' "'You aren't ashamed of your own opinions, are you?' she demanded, with a hint in her voice that she was ready to be scornful. "'You know all the time I'm not,' he repeated the phrase of her previous confession with a certain acrimonious emphasis. "'Don't you?' he added curtly. She remained silent. "'Don't you?' he said more loudly. And as she offered no reply, he went on, marvelling at what was coming out of his mouth. "'I'll tell you what I'm ashamed of. I'm ashamed of seeing my father lose his temper. So you know,' she said. "'I never met anybody like you before. No, never.' At this he was really astounded, and most exquisitely flattered. "'I might say the same of you.' he replied, sticking his chin out. "'Oh, no,' she said, "'I'm nothing.' The fact was that he could not foretell their conversation even ten seconds in advance. It was full of the completely unexpected. He thought to himself, "'You never know what a girl like that will say next.' But what would he say next? 5. They were interrupted by Osmond Orgreave with his, "'Well, Edwin,' jolly, welcoming, and yet slightly quizzical. Edwin could not look him in the face without feeling self-conscious. Nor dared he glance at Hilda to see what her demeanour was like under the good-natured scrutiny of her friend's father. "'We thought you'd forgotten us,' said Mr. Orgreave. "'But well, that's always the way with neighbours. He turned to Hilda. "'It's true,' he continued, jerking his head at Edwin. "'He scarcely ever comes to see us, except when you're here.' "'Steady on,' Edwin murmured. "'Steady on, Mr. Orgreave.' and hastily he asked a question about Mrs. Orgreave's asthma, and from that the conversation passed to the doings of the various absent members of the family. Uh, "'You've been working as usual, I suppose,' said Edwin. "'Working!' laughed Mr. Orgreave. "'I've done what I could with Hilda there. Instead of going up to Kilport with Janet, she would stop here and chatter about strikes.' Hilda smiled at him benevolently, as at one to whom she permitted everything. "'Mr. Clayhanger agrees with me,' she said. "'Oh, you needn't tell me,' protested Mr. Orgreave. "'I could see you were as thick as thieves over it.' He looked at Edwin. "'Has she told you she wants to go over a printing works?' "'No,' said Edwin. "'But I should be very pleased to show her over ours any time.' She made no observation. "'Look here,' said Edwin suddenly. "'I must be off. I only slipped in for a minute, really.' He did not know why he said this, for his greatest wish was to probe more deeply into the tantalising psychology of Hilda Lesways. His tongue, however, had said it, and his tongue reiterated it when Mr. Orgreave urged that Janet and Alicia would be back soon, and that food would then be partaken of. He would not stay. Desiring to stay, he would not. He wished to be alone, to think. Clearly, Hilda had been talking about him to Mr. Orgreave, and to Janet. Did she discuss him and his affairs with everybody? Nor would he, in response to Mr. Orgreave's suggestion, promise definitely to call again on the next evening. He said he would try. Hilda took leave of him nonchalantly. He departed. And as he made the half-circuit of the misty lawn on his way to the gates, he muttered in his heart, where even he himself could scarcely hear, "'I sworn I'd do something, and I haven't. Well, of course, when she talks seriously like that, what could I do?' but he was disgusted with himself and ashamed of his namby pambiness. He strolled thoughtfully up Oak Street and down Trafalgar Road, and when he was near home, another wayfarer saw him face right about and go up Trafalgar Road and disappear at the corner of Oak Street. 
The Orgreave servant was surprised to see him at the front door again when she answered a discreet ring. "'I wish you'd tell Miss Lesways I want to speak to her a moment, will you?' "'Miss Lesways?' "'Yes. What an adventure. "'Certainly, sir. Will you come in?' She shut the door. "'Ask her to come here,' he said, smiling with deliberate confidential persuasiveness. She nodded with a brighter smile. The servant vanished, and Hilda came. She was as red as fire. He began hurriedly, "'When will you come to look over our works? Tomorrow. I should like you to come.' He used a tone that said, "'I don't let's have any nonsense. You know you want to come.' She frowned, frankly. There they were in the hall, like a couple of conspirators. But she was frowning. She would not meet him half-way. He wished he had not permitted himself this caprice. What importance had a private oath? He felt ridiculous. "'What time?' she demanded, and in an instant transformed his disgust into delight. "'Any time.' His heart was beating with expectation. "'Oh, no, you must fix the time.' "'Well, after tea, say, between half-past six and a quarter to seven. That do?' She nodded. "'Good,' he murmured. "'That's all. Thanks. Good night.' He hastened away with a delicate photograph of the palm of her hand printed in minute sensations on the palm of his. "'I did it, anyhow,' he muttered aloud in his heart. At any rate, he was not ashamed. At any rate, he was a man. The man's face was burning, and the damp, noxious chill of the night only caressed him agreeably. End of Volume 2, Chapter 17 Volume 2, Chapter 18 of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Ellers. Volume 2, Chapter 18 Curiosity. He was afraid that, from some obscure motive for propriety or self protection, she would bring Janet with her, or perhaps Alicia. On the other hand, he was afraid that she would come alone. That she should come alone seemed to him, in spite of his reason, too brazen. Moreover, if she came alone, would he be equal to the situation? Would he be able to carry the thing off in a manner adequate? He lacked confidence. He desired the moment of her arrival, and yet he feared it. His heart and his brain were all confused together in a turmoil of emotion which he could not analyse nor define. He was in love. Love had caught him, and had affected his vision so that he no longer saw any phenomenon as it actually was, neither himself, nor Hilda, nor the circumstances which were uniting them. He could not follow a train of thought, he could not remain of one opinion, nor in one mind. Within himself he was perpetually discussing Hilda and her attitude. She was marvellous, but was she? She admired him, but did she? She had shown cunning, but was it not simplicity? He did not even feel sure whether he liked her. He tried to remember what she looked like, and he positively could not. The one matter upon which he could be sure was that his curiosity was hotly engaged. If he had had to state the case in words to another, he would not have gone further than the word curiosity. He had no notion that he was in love. He did not know what love was. He had not had sufficient opportunity of learning. Nevertheless, the processes of love were at work within him. Silently and magically, by the force of desire and of pride, the refracting glass was being specially ground, which would enable him, which would compel him, to see an ideal Hilda when he gazed at the real Hilda. He would not see the real Hilda any more, unless some cataclysm should shatter the glass. And he might be likened to a prisoner on whom the gate of freedom is shut for ever, or to a stricken sufferer of whom it is known that he can never rise again and go forth into the fields. He was as somebody to whom the irrevocable had happened. And he knew it not. None knew. None guessed. All day he went his ways, striving to conceal the whirring preoccupation of his curiosity, a curiosity which he thought showed a fine masculine dash, and succeeded fairly well. 
the excellent, simple Maggie alone remarked in secret that he was slightly nervous and unnatural. But even she, with all her excellent simplicity, did not divine his victimhood. At six o'clock he was back at the shop from his tea. It was a wet, chill night. On the previous evening he had caught cold, and he was beginning to sneeze. He said to himself that Hilda could not be expected to come on such a night. But he expected her. When the shop clock showed half-past six, he glanced at his watch, which also showed half-past six. Now, at any instant, she might arrive. The shop door opened, and simultaneously his heart ceased to beat. The person who came in, puffing and snorting, was his father, who stood within the shop while shaking his soaked umbrella over the exterior porch. The draught from the shiny dark street and square struck cold, and Edwin responsively sneezed. And Darius Clay upbraided him for not having worn his overcoat, and he replied with foolish unconvincingness that he had got a cold, that it was nothing. Darius grunted his way into the cubicle. Edwin remained in busy idleness at the right-hand counter. Stifford was tidying the contents of drawers behind the fancy counter, and the fizzing gas-burners, inevitable accompaniment of night at the period, kept watch above. Under the heat of the stove, the damp marks of Darius Clayhanger's entrance disappeared more quickly than the minutes ran. It grew almost impossible for Edwin to pass the time. At moments, when his father was not stirring in the cubicle and Stifford happened to be in repose, he could hear the ticking of the clock, which he could not remember ever having heard before, except when he mounted the steps to wind it. At a quarter to seven, he said to himself that he gave up hope while pretending that he never had hoped, and that Hilda's presence was indifferent to him. If she came not that day, she would probably come some other day. What could it matter? He was very unhappy. He said to himself that he should have a long night's reading, but the prospect of reading had no savour. He said, "'No, I shan't go in to see them to-night. I, I shall stay in and nurse my cold and read.' This was mere futile bravado, for the impartial spectator in him, though far less clear-sighted and judicial now than formerly, foresaw with certainty that if Hilda did not come, he would call at the Orgreaves. At five minutes to seven, he was miserable. He decided to hope until five minutes to seven. He made it seven in despair. Then there were signs of a figure behind the misty glass of the door. The door opened. It could not be she. Impossible that it should be she. But it was she. She had the air of being a, a miracle. 2. His feelings were complex and contradictory, flitting about and crossing each other in his mind with astounding rapidity. He wished she had not come, because his father was there, and the thought of his father would intensify his self-consciousness. He wondered why he should care whether she came or not. After all, she was only a young woman who wanted to see a printing works. At best, she was not so agreeable as Janet, at worst, she was appalling, and moreover, he knew nothing about her. He had a glimpse of her face, as, with a little tightening of the lips, she shut her umbrella. What was there in that face, judged impartially? Why should he be to so absurd a degree curious about her? He thought how exquisitely delicious it would be to be walking with her by the shore of a lovely lake on a summer evening, pale hills in the distance. He had this momentary vision by reason of a coloured print of the silver strand of a Scottish lock, which was leaning in a gilt frame against the artist's materials cabinet, and was marked twelve and six. During the day he had imagined himself with her in all kinds of beautiful spots and situations. But the chief of his sensations was one of exquisite relief. She had come. He could wreak his hungry curiosity upon her. Yes, she was alone. No Janet, no Alicia. How had she managed it? What had she said to the Orgreaves? That she should have come alone and through the November rain in the night affected him deeply. It gave her the quality of a heroine of high adventure. It was as though she had set sail unaided in a frail skiff on a formidable ocean to meet him. It was inexpressibly romantic and touching. She came towards him, her face sedately composed. 
She wore a small hat, a veil, and a mackintosh, and black gloves that were splashed with wet. Certainly she was a practical woman. She had said she would come, and she had come, sensibly, but how charmingly protected against the shocking conditions of the journey. There's naught charming in a mackintosh, and yet there was in this mackintosh. Something in the contrast between its harshness and her fragility. The veil was supremely charming. She had half-lifted it, exposing her mouth. The upper part of her flushed face was caged behind the bars of the veil. Behind those bars her eyes mysteriously gleamed. Spanish! No exaggeration in all this. He felt every bit of it honestly, as he stood at the counter in thrilled expectancy. By virtue of his impassioned curiosity, the terraces of Granada and the mantillas of Signoritas were not more romantic than he had made his father's shop and her dripping mackintosh. He tried to see her afresh. He tried to see her as though he had never seen her before. He tried desperately once again to comprehend what it was in her that piqued him. And he could not. He fell back from the attempt. Was she the most wondrous, or was she commonplace? Was she deceiving him, or did he alone possess the true insight? Useless. He was baffled. Far from piercing her soul, he could scarcely even see her at all, that is, with intelligence. And it was always so when he was with her. He was in a dream, a vapour, he had no helm. His faculties were not under control. She robbed him of judgment. And then the clear tones of her voice fell on the listening shop. "'Good evening, Mr. Clayhanger. What a night, isn't it? I hope I'm not too late.' Firm, business-like syllables, and she straightened her shoulders. He suffered. He was not happy. Whatever his feelings, he was not happy in that instant. He was not happy because he was wrung between hope and fear, alike divine. But he would not have exchanged his sensations for the extremest felicity of any other person. They shook hands. He suggested that she should remove her mackintosh. She consented. He had no idea that the effect of the removal of the mackintosh would be so startling as it was. She stood, intimately revealed in her frock. The mackintosh was formal and defensive. The frock was intimate and acquiescent. Darius blundered out of the cubicle, and Edwin had a dreadful moment introducing her to Darius and explaining their purpose. Why had he not prepared the ground in advance? His pusillanimous cowardice again. However, the directing finger of God sent a customer into the shop, and Edwin escaped with his Hilda through the aperture in the counter. 3. The rickety building at the back of the premises, which was still the main theatre of printing activities, was empty, save for Big James, the hour of seven being past. Big James was just beginning to roll his apron round his waist in preparation for departure. This happened to be one of the habits of his advancing age. Up till a year or two previously he would have taken off his apron and left it in the workshop, but now he could not confide it to the workshop. He must carry it about him until he reached home and a place of safety for it. When he saw Edwin and a young lady appear in the doorway, he let the apron fall over his knees again. As the day was only the second of the industrial week, the apron was almost clean, and even the office towel which hung on a roller somewhat conspicuously near the door was not offensive. A single gas jet burned. The workshop was in the languor of repose after toil, which had officially commenced at 8 a.m. The perfection of Big James's attitude, an attitude symbolised by the letting down of his apron, helped to put Edwin at ease in the original and difficult circumstances. "'Good evening, Mr. Edwin. Good evening, miss,' was all that the man actually said with his tongue. But the formality of his majestic gestures indicated in the most dignified way his recognition of a sharp difference of class, and his exact comprehension of his own role in the affair. He stood waiting. He had been about to depart, but he was entirely at the disposal of the company. Oh, th "'This is Mr. Yarlett, our foreman,' said Edwin, and to Big James. "'Miss Lesways has just come to look round.' Hilda smiled. Big James suavely nodded his head. "'Here are some of the types,' said Edwin, 
because a big case was the object nearest to him, and he glanced at Big James. In a moment the foreman was explaining to Hilda, in his superb voice, the use of the composing stick, and he accompanied the theory by a beautiful exposition of the practice. Edwin could stand aside and watch. Hilda listened and looked with an extraordinary air of sympathetic interest. And she was so serious, so adult. But it was the quality of sympathy, he thought, that was her finest, her most attractive. It was either that or her proud independence, as of a person not accustomed to bend to the will of others, or to go to others for advice. He could not be sure. No, her finest quality was her mystery. Even now, as he gazed at her comfortably, she baffled him. All her exquisite little movements and intonations baffled him. Of one thing, however, he was convinced, that she was fundamentally different from other women. There was she, and there was the rest of the sex. For appearance's sake, he threw in short phrases now and then, to which Big James, by his mere deportment, gave the importance of the words of a master. "'I suppose you printers did something special among yourselves "'to celebrate the four-hundredth anniversary of the invention of printing?' "'said Hilda suddenly, glancing from Edwin to Big James. "'And Big James and Edwin glanced at one another. "'Neither had ever heard of the four-hundredth anniversary of the invention of printing. "'In a couple of seconds Big James' downcast eye "'had made it clear that he regarded this portion of the episode as master's business. "'When was that?' Uh, let me see, Edwin foolishly blurted out. Oh, some years ago, two or three, perhaps four. I'm afraid we didn't, said Edwin, smiling. Oh, said Edwin slowly, I think they made a great fuss of it in London. She relented somewhat. I don't really know much about it, but the other day I happened to be reading the new history of printing. You know, Cranswick's, isn't it? Oh, yes, Edwin concurred. They had never heard of Cranswick's new history of printing, either. He knew that he was not emerging creditably from this portion of the episode. But he did not care. The whole of his body went hot and then cold as his mind presented the simple question, Why had she been reading the history of printing? Could the reason be any other than her interest in himself? Or was she a prodigy among young women who read histories of everything in addition to being passionate about verse? He said that it was ridiculous to suppose that she would read a history of printing solely from interest in himself. Nevertheless, he was madly happy for a few moments, and, as it were, staggered with joy. He decided to read a history of printing at once. Big James came to the end of his expositions of the craft. The stove was dying out, and the steam boiler cold. Big James regretted that the larger machines could not be seen in action, and that the place was getting chilly. Edwin began to name various objects that were lying about, with their functions, but it was evident that the interest of the workshop was now nearly exhausted. Big James suggested that if Miss could make it convenient to call, say, on the next afternoon, she could see the large new Columbia in motion. Edwin seized the idea and beautified it, and on this he wavered towards the door, and she followed, and Big James, in dignity, bowed them forth to the elevated porch, and began to rewind his flowing apron once more. They pattered down the dark steps, now protected with felt roofing, and ran across six feet of exposed yard into what had once been Mrs. Nixon's holy kitchen. 4. After glancing at sundry minor workshops in delicious propinquity and solitude, they mounted to the first floor, where there was an account-book ruling and binding shop, the sight of the old sitting-room and the girls' bedroom. In each chamber Edwin had to light a gas, and the corridors and stairways were traversed by the ray of matches. It was excitingly intricate. Then they went to the attics, because Edwin was determined that she should see all. There he found a forgotten candle. "'I used to work here,' he said, holding high the candle. "'There was no other place for me to work in.' They were in his old work-attic, now piled with stocks of paper wrapped up in posters. "'Work? What sort of work?' "'Well, reading, drawing, you know, on that very table.' To be sure, there the other very table was, thick with dust. 
it had been too rickety to deserve removal to the heights of Bleakridge. He was touched by the sight of the table now, though he saw it at least once every week. His existence at the corner of Duck Square seemed now to have been beautiful and sad, seemed to be far off and historic, and the attic seemed unhappy in its present humiliation. "'But there's no fireplace,' murmured Hilda. "'I know,' said Edwin. "'But how did you do in winter?' "'I did without.' He had in fact been less of a martyr than those three telling words would indicate. Nevertheless it appeared to him that he really had been a martyr, and he was glad. He could feel her sympathy and her quiet admiration vibrating through the air towards him. Had she not said that she had never met anybody like him? He turned and looked at her. Her eyes glittered in the candlelight with tears too proud to fall. Solemn and exquisite bliss, profound anxiety and apprehension. He was an arena where all the sensations of which a human being is capable struggled in blind confusion. Afterwards, he could recall her visit only in fragments. The next fragment that he recollected was the last. She stood outside the door in her Macintosh. The rain had ceased. She was going. Behind them he could feel his father in the cubicle and Stifford arranging the toilette of the shop for the night. "'Please don't come out here,' she enjoined, half in treaty, half in command. Her solicitude thrilled him. He was on the step, she was on the pavement, so that he looked down at her with the sodden, light-reflecting slope of Duck Square for a background to her. "'Oh, I'm all right. Well, you'll come tomorrow afternoon?' "'No, you aren't all right. You've got a cold, and you'll make it worse. "'And this isn't the end of the winter. It's the beginning. "'I think you're very liable to colds.' "'No,' he said, enchanted, beside himself in an ecstasy of pleasure. "'I shall expect you tomorrow about three. "'Thank you,' she said simply. "'I'll come.' They shook hands. "'Now do go in.' She vanished round the corner. All the evening he neither read nor spoke. End of Volume 2, Chapter 18volume two chapter nineteen of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume two, chapter nineteen A Catastrophe. At half past two on the following afternoon, he is waiting for the future in order to recommence living. During this period, to a greater extent even than the average individual in average circumstances, he was incapable of living in the present. Continually he looked either forward or back. All that he had achieved, or that had been achieved for him, the new house with its brightness and its apparatus of luxury, his books, his learning, his friends, his experience— not long since regarded by him as the precious materials of happiness, all have become negligible trifles, nothings, devoid of import. The sole condition precedent to a tolerable existence was now to have sight and speech of Hilda Lesways. He was intensely unhappy in the long stretches of time which separated one contact with her from the next, and in the brief moments of their companionship he was far too distraught, too apprehensive, too desirous, too puzzled, to be able to call himself happy. Seeing her apparently did not to assuage the pain of his curiosity about her, not his curiosity concerning the details of her life and of her person, for these scarcely interested him, but his curiosity concerning the very essence of her being. At seven o'clock on the previous day he had esteemed her visit as possessing a decisive importance which covered the whole field of his wishes. The visit had occurred, and he was not a whit advanced. Indeed, he had retrograded, for he was less content and more confused, and more preoccupied. The medicine had aggravated the disease. Nevertheless, he waited a second dose of it in the undestroyed illusion of its curative property. In the interval he had behaved like a very sensible man. Without appetite he had still forced himself to eat, lest his relatives should suspect. Short of sleep, he had been careful to avoid yawning at breakfast, and had spoken in a casual tone of Hilda's visit. He had even said to his father, 
I suppose the big Columbia will be running off these overseer notices this afternoon. And on the old man asking why he was thus interested, he had answered, Because that girl, Miss Lesway, has thought of coming down to see it. For some reason or other, she's very keen on printing, and as she's such a friend of the Orgreaves. Nobody, he considered, could have done that better than he had done it. And now, that girl, Miss Lesways, was nearly due. He stood behind the counter again, waiting, waiting. He could not apply himself to anything. He could scarcely wait. He was in a state that approached fever, if not agony. To exist from half-past two to three o'clock equaled in anguish the dreadful inquietude that comes before a surgical operation. He said to himself, "'If I keep on like this, I shall be in love with her one of these days.' He would not, and could not, believe that he already was in love with her, though the possibility presented itself to him. No, he said, you don't fall in love in a couple of days. You mustn't tell me, in a wise, superior, slightly scornful manner. I dare say there's nothing in it at all, he said uncertainly, after having strongly denied throughout that there was anything in it. The recollection of his original antipathy to Hilda troubled him. She was the same girl. She was the same girl who had followed him at night into his father's garden and merited his disdain. She was the same girl who had been so unpleasant, so sharp, so rudely disconcerting in her behaviour. And he dared not say that she had altered, and yet now he could not get her out of his head. And although he would not admit that he constantly admired her, he did admit that there were moments when he admired her passionately and deemed her unique and above all women. Whence the change in himself? How to justify it? The problem was insoluble, for he was intellectually too honest to say lightly that originally he had been mistaken. He did not pretend to solve the problem. He looked at it with perturbation and left it. The concerning thing was that the Orgreaves had always expressed high esteem for Hilda. He leaned on the Orgreaves. He wondered how the affair would end. It could not indefinitely continue on its present footing. How indeed would it end? Marriage? He apologised to himself for the thought. But just for the sake of argument, supposing, well, supposing the affair went so far that one day he told her, men did such things, young men. No. Besides, she wouldn't. It was absurd. No such idea, really. And then the frightful worry that there would be with his father about money and so on, and and the telling of Clara, and of everybody. No, he simply could not imagine himself married, or about to be married. Marriage might happen to other young men, but not to him. His case was special, anyhow. He shrank from such formidable enterprises. The mere notion of them made him tremble. 2. He brushed all that away impatiently, pettishly. The intense and terrible longing for her arrival persisted. It was now twenty-five to three. His father would be down soon from his after-dinner nap. Suddenly the door opened, and he saw the Orgreaves servant, with a cloak over her white apron, and hands red with cold. And also he saw disaster like a ghostly figure following her. His heart sickeningly sank. Martha smiled and gave him a note, which he smilingly accepted. "'Miss Lesway has asked me to come down with this,' she said confidentially. She was a little breathless, and she had absolutely the manner of a singing chambermaid in light opera. He opened the note which said, "'Dear Mr. Clayhanger, so sorry I can't come to-day. Yours, H.L.' Nothing else. It was scrawled. "'It's all right, thanks,' he said, with an even brighter smile to the messenger, who nodded and departed. It all occurred in an instant. 3. A Catastrophe he suffered then, as he had never suffered. His was no state approaching agony. It was agony itself, black and awful. She was not coming. She had not troubled herself to give a reason, nor to offer an excuse. She merely was not coming. She had shown no consideration for his feelings. It had not happened to her to reflect that she would be causing him disappointment. Disappointment was too mild a word. He had been building a marvellously beautiful castle, and with a thoughtless, careless stroke of the pen she had annihilated all his labour. She had almost annihilated him. 
Surely she owed him some reason, some explanation. Had she the right to play fast and loose with him like that? What a shame! He sobbed violently in his heart, with an excessive and righteous resentment. He was innocent, he was blameless, and she tortured him thus. He supposed that all women were like her. What a shame! He pitied himself for a victim, and there was no glint of hope anywhere. In half an hour he would have been near her, with her, guiding her to the workshop, discussing the machine with her, and savouring her uniqueness, feasting on her delicious and adorable personality. So sorry I can't come to-day. She doesn't understand, she can't understand, he said to himself. No woman, however cruel, would ever knowingly be so cruel as she has been. It, it isn't possible. Then he sought excuse for her, and then he cast the excuse away angrily. She was not coming. There was no ground beneath his feet. He was so exquisitely miserable that he could not face a future of even ten hours ahead. He could not look at what his existence would be till bedtime. The blow had deprived him of all force, all courage. It was a wanton blow. He wished savagely that he had never seen her. No, no, he could not call on the Orgreaves that night. He, he could not do it. She, she might be out, and then— his father entered and began to grumble. Both Edwin and Maggie had known since the beginning of dinner that Darius was quaking on the precipice of a bad, bilious attack. Edwin listened to the rising storm of words. He had to resume the thread of his daily life. He knew what affliction was. End of Volume 2 Chapter 19《Volume Two, Chapter Twenty of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Two, Chapter Twenty, The Man. But he was young. Indeed, to men of fifty, men just twice his age, he seemed a mere boy and incapable of grief. He was so slim, and his limbs were so loose, and his hair so fair, and his gestures often so naive that few of the mature people who saw him daily striding up and down Trafalgar Road could have believed him to be acquainted with sorrow like their sorrows. The next morning, as it were in justification of these maturer people, his youth arose and fought with the malady in him, and if it did not conquer, it was not defeated. On the previous night, after hours of hesitation, he had suddenly walked forth and gone down Oak Street, and pushed open the garden gates of the Orgreaves, and gazed at the façade of the house, not at her window, because that was on the side. And it was all dark. The Orgreaves had gone to bed. He'd expected it. Even this perfectly futile reconnaissance had calmed him. While dressing in the bleak sunrise, he had looked at the oval lawn of the Orgreaves' garden, and had seen Johnny idly kicking a football on it. Johnny had probably spent the evening with her, and it was nothing to Johnny. She was there, somewhere between him and Johnny, within fifty yards of both of them, mysterious and withdrawn as ever, busy at something or other. And it was naught to Johnny. By the thought of all this, the woe in him was strengthened and embittered. Nevertheless, his youth, aided by the stringent quality of the clear dawn, still struggled sturdily against it, and he ate six times more breakfast than his suffering and insupportable father. At half-past one, it was Thursday, and the shop closed at two o'clock, he had put on courage like a garment, and decided that he would see her that afternoon or night, or perish in the attempt. And as the remembered phrase of the Sunday passed through his mind, he inwardly smiled and thought of school, and felt old and sure. Two. At five minutes to two, as he stood behind the eternal counter in his eternal dream, he had the inexpressible and delectable shock of seeing her. He was shot by the vision of her as by a bullet. She came in, hurried and preoccupied, apparently full of purpose. "'Have you got a Bradshaw?' she inquired, after the briefest greeting, gazing at him across the counter through her veil, as though imploring him for Bradshaw. "'I'm afraid we haven't one left,' he said. "'You see, it's getting on for the end of the month. I—I I could I know, I suppose you want it at once.' "'I want it now,' she replied. "'I'm going to London by the Six Express, and what I want to know is whether I can get on to Brighton to-night. They actually haven't a Bradshaw up there,' half in scorn and half in levity, "'and they said you'd probably have one here, so I ran down.' 
They'd be certain to have one at the tiger, he murmured, reflecting. The tiger? Evidently she did not care for the idea of the tiger. What about the railway station? Oh, yes, or the railway station. I'll go up there with you now, if you like, and find out for you. I know the headquarter. We're just closing. Father's at home. He's not very well. She thanked him, relief in her voice. In a minute he had put his hat and coat on, and given instructions to Stifford, and he was climbing Duck Bank with Hilda at his side. He had forgiven her. Nay, he had forgotten her crime. The disaster, with all its despair, was sponged clean from his mind, like writing off a slate, and, as rapidly, it was effaced. He tried to collect his faculties and savour the new sensations, but he could not. Within him all was incoherent, wild, and distracting. Five minutes earlier, and he could not have conceived the bliss of walking with her to the station. Now he was walking with her to the station, and assuredly it was bliss, and yet he did not fully taste it. Though he would not have loosed her for a million pounds, her presence gave an even crueller edge to his anxiety and apprehension. London! Brighton! Would she be that night in Brighton? He felt helpless and desperate, and beneath all this was the throbbing of a strange, bitter joy. She asked about his cold and about his father's indisposition. She said nothing of her failure to appear on the previous day, and he knew not how to introduce it neatly. He was not in control of his intelligence. They passed Snaggs's theatre, and from its green wooden walls came the obscure sound of humanity in emotion. Before the mean and shabby portals stood a small crowd of ragged urchins. Posters printed by Darius Clayhanger made white squares on the front. "'It's a meeting of the men,' said Edwin. "'They're losing, aren't they?' He shrugged his shoulders. "'I expect they are.' She asked what the building was, and he explained. "'They used to call it the blood tub,' he said. She shivered. "'The blood tub?' "'Yes, uh, melodrama and murder and gore, you know.' "'How horrible!' she exclaimed. "'Why are people like that in the five towns?' "'It's our form of poetry, I suppose,' he muttered, smiling at the pavement which was surprisingly dry and clean in the feeble sunshine. "'I suppose it is,' she agreed heartily after a pause. "'But you belong to the five towns, don't you?' he asked. "'Oh, yes, I used to.' At the station the name of Bradshaw appeared to be quite unknown, but Hilda's urgency implied them upwards from the head-porter to the ticket-clerk, and from the ticket-clerk to the station-master, and at length they discovered, in a stuffy, stove-heated room with a fine view of a short ruck and a pit-head, that on Thursday evenings there was a train from Victoria to Brighton at eleven-thirty. Hilda seemed to sigh relief, and her demeanour changed. But Edwin's uneasiness was only intensified. Brighton! which he had never seen, was in another hemisphere for him. It was mysterious, like her. It was part of her mystery. What could he do? His curse was that he had no initiative. Without her relentless force he would never have penetrated even as far as the stuffy room where the unique Bradshaw lay. It was she who had taken him to the station, not he, her. How could he hold her back from Brighton? 3. When they came again to the blood-tub, she said, "'Couldn't we just go and look in? I've got plenty of time now I know exactly where I stand.' She halted and glanced across the road. He could only agree to the proposition. For himself a peculiar sense of delicacy would have made it impossible for him to intrude his prosperity upon the deliberations of starving artisans on strike and stricken. And he wondered what the potters might think or say about the invasion by a woman.' but he had to traverse the street with her and enter, and he had to do so with an air of masculine protectiveness. The urchin stood apart to let them in. Snaggs's, dimly lit by a few glazed apertures on the roof, was nearly crammed by men who sat on the low benches and leaned standing against the side walls. In the small and tawdry proscenium, behind a worn picture of the May of Naples, were silhouetted the figures of the men's leader, and of several other officials. The leader was speaking in a quiet, mild voice. The other officials were seated on Windsor chairs. The smell of the place was nauseating, and yet the atmosphere was bitingly cold. 
the warm-wrapped visitors could see rows and rows of discoloured backs and elbows and caps and stringy kerchiefs. They could almost feel the contraction of thousands of muscles in an involuntary effort to squeeze out the chill from all these bodies. Not a score of overcoats could be discerned in the whole theatre, and many of the jackets were thin and ragged. But the officials had overcoats, and the visitors could almost see, as it were in rays, the intense fixed glances darting from every part of the interior and piercing the upright figure in the centre of the stage. "'Some method of compromise,' the leader was saying in his persuasive tones. A young man sprang up furiously from the middle benches. "'To hell with compromise!' he shouted in a tigerish passion. "'Haven't us had forty pounds for Ameriki?' "'Order, order!' some protested fiercely. But one voice cried, "'Bitch the bastard old neck and crop!' Hans clawed at the interrupter and dragged him with extreme violence to the level of the bench, where he muttered like a dying volcano. Angry growls shot up here and there, snappish, menacing, and bestial. "'It is quite true,' said the leader soothingly, "'that our comrades at Trenton have collected forty pounds for us. But forty pounds would scarcely pay for a loaf of bread for one man in every ten on strike.' There was more interruption. The dangerous growls continued in running explosions along the benches. The leader, ignoring them, turned to consult with his neighbour, and then faced his audience and called out more loudly, "'The business of the meeting is at an end!' The entire multitude jumped up, and there was stretching of arms and stamping of feet. The men nearest to the door now perceived Edwin and Hilda, who moved backwards as before a flood. Edwin seized Hilda's arm to hasten her. "'Lads,' bawled an old man's voice from near the stage, "'let's sing Rock of Ages!' A frowning and her suit fellow near the door, with the veins prominent on his red forehead, shouted hoarsely, "'Rock of Ages be boogered!' And shifting his hands into his pockets, he plunged for the street, head foremost and chin sticking out murderously. Edwin and Hilda escaped at speed and recrossed the road, the crowd came surging out of the narrow neck of the building and spread over the pavements like a sinister liquid. But from within the building came the lusty song of Rock of Ages. "'It's terrible,' Hilda murmured after a silence. "'Just to see them is enough. I shall never forget what you said.' "'What was that?' he inquired. He knew what it was, but he wished to prolong the taste of her appreciation. "'That you've only got to see the poor things to know they're in the right.' "'Oh, I've lost my handkerchief, unless I've left it in your shop. "'It must have dropped out of my muff.' Four. The shop was closed. As with his latch-key he opened the private door, and then stood on one side for her to precede him into the corridor that led to the back of the shop, he watched the stream of operatives scattering across Duck Bank and descending towards the square. It was as if he and Hilda, being pursued, were escaping. And as Hilda, stopping an instant on the step, saw what he saw. Her face took a troubled expression. They both went in, and he shut the door. Uh, "'Turn to the left,' he said, wondering whether the big Columbia machine would be running, for her to see if she chose. "'Oh, this takes you to the shop, doesn't it? How funny to be behind the counter!' He thought she spoke self-consciously in the way of small talk, which was contrary to her habit. "'Here's my handkerchief,' she cried with pleasure. It was on the counter, a little white wisp in the grey-sheeted gloom. Stifford must have found it on the floor and picked it up. The idea flashed through Obin said, "'Did she leave the handkerchief on purpose, so that we should have to come back here?' The only illumination of the shop was from three or four diamond-shaped holes in the upper part of as many shutters. No object was at first quite distinct. The corners were very dark. All merchandise not in drawers or on shelves was hidden in pale dust-cloths. A chair, wrong side up, was on the fancy counter, its back hanging over the front of the counter. Hilda had wandered behind the other counter, and Edwin was in the middle of the shop. Her face in the twilight had become more mysterious than ever. He was in a state of emotion, but he did not know to what category the emotion belonged. They were alone. Stifford had gone for the half-holiday, Darius, sickly, would certainly not come near. 
The printers were at working as usual in their place, and the clanking whir of a treadle machine overhead agitated the ceiling. But nobody would enter the shop. His excitement increased, but did not define itself. There was a sudden roar in Duck Square, and then cries. "'What can that be?' Hilda asked, low. "'Some of the strikers,' he answered, and went through the doors to the letter-hole in the central shutter, lifted the flap, and looked through. A struggle was in progress at the entrance to the Duck Inn. One man was apparently drunk. Others were jeering on the skirts of the lean crowd. "'It's some sort of a fight among them,' said Edwin loudly, so that she could hear in the shop. But at the same instant he felt the wind of the door swinging behind him, and Hilda was silently at his elbow. L- "'Let me look,' she said. Assuredly her voice was trembling. He moved as little as possible and held the flap up for her. She bent and gazed. He could hear various noises in the square, but she described nothing to him. After a long while she withdrew from the hole. "'A lot of them have gone into the public-house,' she said. "'The others seem to be moving away. "'There's a policeman.' "'What a shame!' she burst out passionately. "'That they have to drink to forget their trouble.' She made no remark upon the strangeness of starving workmen being able to pay for beer sufficient to intoxicate themselves. Nor did she comment, as a woman, on the misery of the wives and children at home in the slums and the cheap cottage rows. She merely compassionated the men— in that they were driven to brutishness. Her features showed painful pity, masking disgust. She stepped back into the shop. "'Do you know,' she began in a new tone, "'you've quite altered my notion of poetry. What you said as we were going up to the station?' "'Really?' he smiled nervously. He was very pleased. He would have been astounded by this speech from her, a professed devotee of poetry— if in those instants the capacity for astonishment had remained to him. "'Yes,' she said, and continued, frowning and picking at her muff. "'But you do alter my notions. I don't know how it is. So this is your little office.' The door of the cubicle was open. "'Yes, go in and have a look at it.' "'Shall I?' She went in. He followed her. And no sooner was she in there than she muttered, "'I must hurry off now.' Yet a moment before she seemed to have infinite leisure. "'Shall you be at Brighton long?' he demanded, and scarcely recognised his own accents. "'Oh, I can't tell. I've no idea. It depends. "'How soon should it be down our way again?' She only shook her head. "'I say, you know,' he protested. "'Good-bye,' she said, quavering. "'Thanks very much.' She held out her hand. "'But—' He took her hand— His suffering was intolerable. It was torture of the most exquisite kind. Her hand pressed his. Something snapped in him. His left hand hovered, shaking over her shoulder, and then touched her shoulder, and he could feel her left hand on his arm. The embrace was clumsy in its instinctive and unskilled violence, but its clumsiness was redeemed by all his sincerity, and all hers. His eyes were within six inches of her eyes, full of delicious shame anxiety, and surrender. They kissed. He had amorously kissed a woman. All his past life sank away, and he began a new life on the impetus of that supreme and final emotion. It was an emotion that in its freshness, agitating and divine, could never be renewed. He had felt the virgin answer of her lips on his. She had told him everything. She had yielded up her mystery, in a second of time. Her courage in responding to his caress ravished and amazed him. She was so unaffected, so simple, so heroic. And the cool, delicate purity of those lips, and the faint feminine odour of her flesh, and even of her stuffs. Dreams and visions were surpassed. He said to himself, in the flood-tide of masculinity, "'My God, she's mine.' and it seemed incredible. 5. She was sitting in the office chair, he on the desk. She said in a trembling voice, "'I should never have come to the five towns again if you hadn't—' "'Why not?' "'I couldn't have stood it. I couldn't.' 
she spoke almost bitterly, with a peculiar smile on her twitching lips. To him it seemed that she had resumed her mystery, that he had only really known her for one instant, that he was bound to a woman entrancing, noble, but impenetrable. And this, in spite of the fact that he was close to her, touching her, tingling to her in the confined, crepuscular intimacy of the cubicle. He could trace every movement of her breast as she breathed, and yet she escaped the inward searching of his gaze. But he was happy. He was happy enough to repel all anxieties and inquietudes about the future. He was steeped in the bliss of the miracle. This was but the fourth day, and they were vowed. "'It was only Monday,' he began. "'Monday!' she exclaimed. "'I have thought of you for over a year.' She leaned towards him. "'Didn't you know? Of course you did. You couldn't bear me at first. He denied this, blushing, but she insisted. "'You don't know how awful it was for me yesterday when you didn't come,' he murmured. "'Was it?' she said under her breath. "'I had some very important letters to write.' She clasped his hand. There it was again. She spoke just like a man of business, immersed in secret schemes. "'It's awfully funny,' he said. I, "'I scarcely know anything about you, and yet—' "'I'm Janet's friend,' she answered. Perhaps it was the delicatest reproof of imagined distrust. "'And I don't want to,' he went on. "'How old are you?' Twenty four, she answered sweetly, acknowledging his right to put such questions. "'I thought you were.' "'I suppose you know I've got no relatives,' she said, as if relenting from her attitude of reproof. "'Fortunately, father left just enough money for me to live on.' "'Must you go to Brighton?' she nodded. "'Where can I write to?' "'It will depend,' she said. "'But I shall send you the address to-morrow. "'I shall write you before I go to bed, whether it's to-night or to-morrow morning.' "'I wonder what people will say.' "'Please tell no one yet,' she pleaded. "'Really, I should prefer not. "'Later on it would seem so sudden. "'People are so silly.' "'But shan't you tell Janet?' "'She hesitated. "'No, let's keep it to ourselves till I come back.' "'When shall you come back?' "'Oh, very soon. "'I hope in a few days now. "'But I must go to this friend at Brighton. "'She's relying on me.' "'It was enough for him, "'and indeed he liked the idea of a secret. "'Yes, yes.' he agreed eagerly. There was the sound of another uproar in Duck Square. It appeared to roll to and fro thunderously. She shivered. The fire was dead out in the stove, and the chill of night crept in from the street. "'It's nearly dark,' she said. "'I must go. I have to pack. Oh, dear, dear, those poor men! Somebody will be hurt!' "'I'll walk up with you,' he whispered, holding her in ownership. "'No, it would be better not. Let me out.' "'Really? Really. "'But who'll take you to Knipe Station? "'Janet will go with me.' "'She rose reluctantly. "'In the darkness they were now only dim forms to each other. "'He struck a match that blinded them and expired as they reached the passage. "'When she had gone he stood hatless at the open side door. "'Right at the top of Duck Bank he could discern, under the big lamp there, "'a knot of gesticulating and shouting strikers menacing two policemen. "'and farther off in the direction of Moorthorne Road, "'other strikers were running. "'The yellow-lit blinds of the Duck Inn across the square "'seemed to screen a house of impenetrable conspiracies and debaucheries. "'And all that grim, perilous background "'only gave to his emotions a further intensity, "'troubling them to still stranger ecstasy. "'He thought, "'It has happened to me now, "'this thing that is at the bottom of everybody's mind. "'I've kissed her. "'I've got her. She's marvellous, marvellous. I couldn't have believed it. "'But is it true? Has it happened?' "'It passed his credence. "'By Jove! I absolutely forgot about the ring. That's a nice howdy do "'He saw himself married. He thought of Clara's grotesque antics with her tedious babe. "'And he thought of his father and of vexations. "'But that night he was a man. She... Hilda, with her independence and her mystery, had inspired him with a full pride of manhood. And he discovered that one of the chief attributes of a man is an immense tenderness. End of
of Volume Two, Chapter Twenty. Volume Two, Chapter Twenty One of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Two, Chapter Twenty One, The Marriage. He was more proud and agitated than happy. The romance of the affair and its secrecy made him proud. The splendid qualities of Hilda made him proud. It was her mysteriousness that agitated him, and her absence rendered him unhappy in his triumph. During the whole of Friday he was thinking, "'Tomorrow is Saturday, and I shall have her address and a letter from her.' He decided that there was no hope of a letter by the last post on Friday, but as the hour of the last post drew nigh he grew excited, and was quite appreciably disappointed when it brought nothing. The fear, which had always existed in little, then waxed into enormous dread that Saturday's post also would bring nothing. His manoeuvres in the early twilight of Saturday morning were complicated by the fact that it had not been arranged whether she should write to the shop or to the house. However, he prepared for either event by having his breakfast at seven o'clock, on the plea of a special work in the shop. He had finished it at half-past seven, and was waiting for the postman, whose route he commanded from the dining-room window. The postman arrived. Edwin, with false calm, walked into the hall, saying to himself that if the letter was not in the box it would be at the shop. But the letter was in the box. He recognised her sprawling hand on the envelope through the wirework. He snatched the letter and slipped upstairs with it like a fox with a chicken. It had come, then. The letter safely in his hands, he admitted more frankly than he had been, very doubtful of its promptitude. 25 Preston Street, Brighton, 1 a.m. Dearest, this is my address. I love you. Every bit of me is absolutely yours. Write me. H. L. That was all. It was enough. Its tone enchanted him. Also, it startled him. But it reminded him of her lips. He had begun a letter to her. He saw now that what he had written was too cold in the expression of his feelings. Hilda's note suddenly and completely altered his views upon the composition of love-letters. "'Every bit of me is absolutely yours. "'How fine, how untrammelled, how like Hilda! "'What other girl could or would have written such a phrase? "'More than ever was he convinced that she was unique. "'The thrill divine quickened in him again, "'and he rose eagerly to her level of passion. "'The romance, the secrecy, the mystery, the fever!' He walked down Trafalgar Road with the letter in his pocket, and once he pulled it out to read it in the street. His discretion objected to this act, but Edwin was not his own master. Stifford, hurrying in exactly at eight, was somewhat perturbed to find his employer's son already installed in the cubicle, writing by the light of gas, as the shutters were not removed. Edwin had finished and stamped his first love letter just as his father entered the cubicle. Owing to dispected accidents, Darius had not set foot in the cubicle since it had been sanctified by Hilda. Edwin, leaving it, glanced at the old man's back, and thought disdainfully, "'Ah, you little know, you rhinoceros, that less than two days ago she and I on that very spot!' As soon as his father had gone to pay the morning visits to the printing shops, he ran out to post the letter himself. He could not be contented until it was in the post." Now, when he saw men of about his own class and age in the street, he would speculate upon their experiences in the romance of women. And it did genuinely seem to him impossible that anybody else in a town like Bursley could have passed through an episode so exquisitely strange and beautiful as that through which he was passing. Yet his reason told him that he must be wrong there. His reason, however, left him tranquil in the assurance that no girl in Bursley had ever written to her affianced, I love you. Every bit of me is absolutely yours. Hilda's second letter did not arrive till the following Tuesday, by which time he had become distracted by fears and doubts. Yes, doubts. No rational being could have been more loyal than Edwin, but these little doubts would keep shooting up and withering away. He could not control them. The second letter was nearly as short as the first. It told him nothing, save her love, and that she was very worried by her friend's situation, and that his letters were a joy. She had had a letter from him each day. In his reply to her second, he gently implied, between two lines, that her letters lacked quantity and frequency. She answered 
I simply cannot write letters. It isn't in me. Can't you tell that from my handwriting? Not even to you. You must take me as I am. She wrote each day for three days. Edwin was one of those who learned quickly by the acceptance of facts, and he now learnt that profound lesson that an individual must be taken or left in entirety, and that you cannot change an object merely because you love it. Indeed, he saw in her phrase, You must take me as I am, the accents of original and fundamental wisdom, springing from the very roots of life. And he submitted. At intervals he would say resentfully, But surely she could find five minutes each day to drop me a line. What's five minutes? But he submitted. Submission was made easier when he coordinated with Hilda's idiosyncrasy the fact that Maggie, his own unromantic sister, could never begin to write a letter with less than from twelve to twenty-four hours bracing of herself to the task. Maggie would be saying and saying, "'I really must write that letter. Dear me, I haven't written that letter yet.' His whole life seemed to be lived in the post, and postmen were the angels of the creative spirit. His unhappiness increased with the deepening of the impression that the loved creature was treating him with cruelty. Time dragged. At length he being engaged a fortnight. On Thursday a letter should have come. It came not. Not on Friday, nor Saturday. On Sunday it must come. But it did not come on Sunday. He determined to telegraph to her on the Monday morning. His loyalty, though valorous, needed aid against all those pricking battalions of ephemeral doubts. On the Sunday evening he suddenly had the idea of strengthening himself by a process that resembled boat-burning. He would speak to his father. His father's mentality was the core of a difficulty that troubled him exceedingly, and he took it into his head to attack the difficulty at once, on the spot. 2. For years past, Darius Clayhanger had not gone to chapel on Sunday evening. In the morning he still went fairly regularly, but in the evening he would now sit in the drawing-room, generally alone, to read. On weekdays he never used the drawing-room, where indeed there was seldom a fire. He had been accustomed to only one living-room, and save on Sunday when he cared to bend the major part of his mind to the matter, he scorned to complicate existence by utilising all the resources of the house which he had built. His children might do so, but not he. He was proud enough to see to it that his house had a drawing-room, and too proud to employ the drawing-room except on the ceremonious day. After tea, at about a quarter to six, when chapel girls were hurriedly putting gloves on, he would begin to establish himself in a saddle-backed, ear-flapped easy-chair with the Christian news and an ivory paper knife as long and nearly as deadly as a scimitar. The Christian news was a religious weekly of a new type. It belonged to a Mr. James Bott, and it gave to God and to the mysteries of religious experience a bright and breezy actuality. Darius's children had damned it for ever on its first issue, in which Clara had found, in a report of a very important charitable meeting, the following words. Among those present were the Prince of Wales and Mr. James Bott. Such is the hasty and unjudicial nature of children that this single sentence finished the career of the Christian news with the younger generation. But Darius liked it, and continued to like it. He enjoyed it. He would spend an hour and a half in reading it. And further, he enjoyed cutting open the morsel. Once, when Edwin, in hope of more laughter, had cut the pages on a Saturday afternoon, and his father had found himself unable to use the paper-knife on Sunday evening, there had been a formidable inquiry. "'Who's been meddling with my paper?' Darius saved the paper even from himself until Sunday evening. Not till then would he touch it. This habit had flourished for several years. It appeared never to lose its charm. And Edwin did not cease to marvel at his father's pleasure— in a tedious monotony. It was the hallowed rite of reading the Christian news that Edwin disturbed in his sudden and capricious resolve. Maggie and Mrs. Nixon had gone to chapel, for Mrs. Nixon, by reason of her years, bearing, mantle, and reputation, could walk down Trafalgar Road by the side of her mistress on a Sunday night without offence to the delicate instincts of the town. The niece, engaged to be married at an age absurdly youthful, had been permitted by Mrs. Nixon the joy of attending evensong at the Bleakridge Church on the arm of a male, but on a promise to be back at a quarter to eight to set supper. The house was perfectly still, 
when Edwin came all on fire out of his bedroom and slid down the stairs. The gas burnt economically low within its stained glass cage in the hall. The drawing-room door was unlatched. He hesitated a moment on the mat, and he could hear the calm ticking of the clock in the kitchen and see the red glint of the kitchen fire against the wall. Then he entered, looking and feeling apologetic. His father was all curtained in, his slippered feet on the fender of the blazing hearth, his head cushioned to a nicety, the long paper-knife across his knees, and the woman was really hot and in a glow of light. Darius turned, and, lowering his face, gazed at Edwin over the top of his new gold-rimmed spectacles. "'Not gone to chapel?' he frowned. "'No. I say, father, I, I just wanted to speak to you.' Darius made no reply, but shifted his glance from Edwin to the far, and maintained his frown. He was displeased at the interruption. Edwin failed to shut the door at the first attempt, and then banged it in his nervousness. In spite of himself, he felt like a criminal. Coming forward, he leaned his loose, slim frame against a corner of the old piano. 3. Well, Darius growled impatiently, even savagely. They saw each other not once a week, but at nearly every hour of every day, and they were surfeited of the companionship. "'Supposing I wanted to get married?' This sentence shot out of Edwin's mouth like a bolt, and as it flew he blushed very red. In the privacy of his mind he was horribly swearing. "'So that's it, is it?' the Rias growled again, and he leaned forward and picked up the poker, not as a menace, but because he too was nervous. As an opposer of his son he had never had quite the same confidence in himself since Edwin's historic fury at being suspected of theft— so apparently their relations had resumed the old basis of bullying and submission. Well, Edwin hesitated, he thought, after all, people do get married, it won't be a crime. Who's to been running after? Darius demanded inimically. Instead of being softened by this rumour of love, by this hint that his son had been passing through wondrous secret hours, he instinctively, and without any reason, hardened himself and transformed the news into an offence. He felt no sympathy, and it did not occur to him to recall that he too had once thought of marrying. He was a man whom life had brutalised about half a century earlier. "'I, I was only thinking,' said Edmund clumsily. The fool had not sense enough even to sit down. "'I was only thinking, supposing I did want to get married.' "'Who's been running after?' "'Well, I, I can't rightly say there's anything what you may call settled. In fact, nothing was to be said about it at all at present, but—' "'It's Miss Lesway's father, Hilda Lesway's, you know.' "'Ada's came in the shop the other day?' "'Yes.' "'How long's this been going on?' Edwin thought of what Hilda had said. "'Oh, over a year.' He could not possibly have said four days. "'Mind you, this is strictly QT. Nobody knows a word about it, nobody. But of course I thought I'd better tell you. You'll say nothing?' He tried wistfully to appeal as one loyal man to another. But he failed. There was no ray of response on his father's gloomy features, and he slipped back insensibly into the boy whose right to an individual existence had never been formally admitted. Something base in him, something of that baseness which occasionally actuates the oppressed, made him add, "'She's got an income of her own. Her father left money.' He conceived that this would placate Darius. "'I know all about her father,' Darius sneered with a short laugh. "'And her father's father. "'Well, lad, you'll go your own road.' He appeared to have no further interest in the affair. Edwin was not surprised, for Darius was seemingly never interested in anything except his business. But he thought how strange, how nigh to the incredible, the old man's demeanour was. "'But about money, I, I was thinking,' he said, uneasily shifting his pose. "'What about money?' "'Well,' said Edwin, endeavouring and failing to find courage to put a little sharpness into his tone, "'I couldn't marry on seventeen and six a week, could I?' At the age of twenty-five, at the end of nine years' experience in the management and the accountancy of a general printing and stationery business, Edwin was receiving seventeen shillings and sixpence for a sixty-five-hour week's work, the explanation being that on his father's death the whole enterprise would be his— and that all money saved was saved for him. 
Out of this sum, he had to pay ten shillings a week to Maggie, towards the cost of board and lodging, so that three half-crowns remained for his person and his soul. Thus, he could expect no independence of any kind until his father's death, and he had a direct and powerful interest in his father's death. Moreover, all his future and all unpaid reward of his labours in the past hung hazardous on his father's good will. If he quarrelled with him, he might lose everything. Edwin was one of a few odd-minded persons who did not regard this arrangement as perfectly just, proper, and in accordance with sound precedent. But he was helpless. His father would tell him, and did tell him, that he had fought no struggles, suffered no hardship, had no responsibility, and that he was simply coddled from head to foot in cotton wool. "'I say you must go your own road,' said his father. "'But at this rate I should never be able to marry.' "'Do you reckon,' asked Marias, with cold, mild scorn, "'as you getting married will make your services worth one penny more to my business?' And he waited an answer with the august calm of one who is aware that he is unanswerable. But he might, with equal propriety, have tied his son's hand behind him, and then diverted himself by punching his head. "'I do all I can,' said Edwin meekly. "'And what about getting orders?' Darius questioned grimly. "'Didn't I offer you two and a half per cent on all new customers you got yourself? "'And how many have you got? Not one. "'I give you a chance to make extra money, and you don't take it. "'You'd sooner go running about after girls.' "'This was a particular grievance of the father against the son, "'that the son brought no grist to the mill in the shape of new orders. "'How can I get orders?' Ebbin protested. "'How did I get them? How did I get them? Somebody has to get them.' The old man's lips were pressed together, and he waved the Christian news slightly in his left hand. 4. In a few minutes both their voices had risen. Darius, savage, stooped to replace with a shovel a large burning coal that had dropped on the tiles, and was sending up a column of brown smoke. "'I'll tell you what I shall do,' he said, controlling himself bitterly. "'It's against my judgment, but I shall put you up to a pound a week at the new year, if all goes well, of course.' "'and it's good money, let me add.' "'He was entirely serious, and almost sincere. "'He loathed paying money over to his son. "'He was convinced that in an ideal world "'sons would toil gratis for their fathers, "'who lodged and fed them and gifted them "'with the reversion of excellent businesses. "'But what good's a pound a week?' "'Edwin demanded, with the querulous of one who is losing hope. "'What good's a pound a week?' Darius repeated hurt, and genuinely hurt. Let me tell you that in my time young men married on a pound a week, and glad to. A pound a week? He finished with a sardonic exclamation. I couldn't marry Miss Lesways on a pound a week, Edwin murmured in despair, his lower lip hanging. I thought you might perhaps be offering me a partnership by this time. Possibly, in some mad hour, a thought so wild had indeed flitted through his brain. "'Did you?' rejoined Darius. And in the fearful grimness of the man's accents was concealed all his intense and egoistic sense of possessing in absolute ownership the business which the little boy out of the Bastille had practically created. Edwin did not and could not understand the fierce strength of his father's emotion concerning the business. Already in tacitly agreeing to leave Edwin the business after his own death, Darius imagined himself to be superbly benevolent. "'And then there would be house furnishing, and so on,' Edwin continued. "'What about that fifty pounds?' Darius curtly inquired. Edwin was startled. Never since the historic scene had Darius made the slightest reference to the proceeds of the building society share. "'I, I haven't spent all of it,' Edwin muttered. Do what he would with his brain, the project of marriage and house-tenancy and a separate existence obstinately presented itself to him, as fantastic and preposterous. Who was he to ask so much from destiny? He could not feel that he was a man. In his father's presence he never could feel that he was a man. He remained a boy, with no rights, moral or material. "'I never she say she's got money of her own,' Darius remarked, and was considerably astonished when the boy walked straight out of the room and closed the door.' 
It was his last grain of common sense that took Edwin in silence out of the room. Miserable, despicable baseness! Did the old devil suppose that he would be capable of asking his wife to find the resources which he himself could not bring? He was to say to his wife, I can only supply a pound a week, but as you've got money it won't matter. The mere notion outraged him so awfully that if he had stayed in the room there would have been an altercation and perhaps a permanent estrangement. As he stood, furious and impotent in the hall, he thought, with his imagination quickened by the memory of Mr. Shushan's, "'When you're old and I've got you,' he clenched his fist in his teeth, "'when I've got you and you can't help yourself, by God it'll be my turn!' And he meant it. 5. He seized his overcoat and hat, and, putting them on anyhow, strode out. The kitchen clock struck half-past seven as he left. Chapel girls would soon be returning in a thin procession of twos and threes up Trafalgar Road. To avoid meeting acquaintances, he turned down the side street towards the old road, which was a continuation of Abukir Street. There he would be safe. Letting his overcoat fly open, he thrust his hands into the pocket of his trousers. It was a cold night of mist. Humanity was separated from him by the semi-transparent blinds of the cottage windows, bright squares in the dark and enigmatic facades of the street. He was alone. All along he had felt and known that this disgusting crisis would come to pass. He had hoped against it, but not with faith. And he had no remedy for it. What could he immediately and effectively do? He was convinced that his father would not yield. There were frequent occasions when his father was proof against reason, when his father seemed genuinely unable to admit the claim of justice, and this occasion was one of them. He could tell by certain peculiarities of tone and gesture. A pound a week! Assuming that he cut loose from his father in a formal and confessed separation, he might not for a long time be in a position to earn more than a pound a week. The clerk was worth no more. And, except as responsible manager of a business, he could only go into the market as a clerk. In the five towns, how many printing offices were there that might at some time or another be in need of a manager? Probably not one. They were all of modest importance, and directed personally by the proprietary heads. His father's was one of the largest. No, his father had nurtured and trained in him a helpless slave. And how could he discuss such a humiliating question with Hilda? Could he say to Hilda, See here, my father won't allow me more than a pound a week. What are we to do? In what terms should he telegraph to her to-morrow? He heard the rapid, firm footsteps of a wayfarer overtaking him. He had no apprehension of being disturbed in his bitter rage. But a hand was slapped on his shoulder, and a jolly voice said, "'Now, Edwin, where's this road leading you to on a Sunday night?' It was Osmond Orgreave, who, having been tramping for exercise in the high regions beyond the Loop railway line, was just going home. "'Oh, nowhere particular,' said Edwin feebly. "'I'm working off Sunday dinner, eh?' "'Yes,' and Edwin added casually to prove that there was nothing singular in his mood. "'Nasty night.' "'You must come in a bit,' said Mr. Orgreave. "'Oh, no,' he shrank away. "'Now, now,' said Mr. Orgreave masterfully. "'You've got to come in, so you may as well give up first as last. "'Janet's in. She's like you and me. She's a bad lot. Hasn't been to church.' He took Edwin by the arm, and they turned into Oak Street at the lower end. Edwin continued to object, but Mr. Orgreave, unable to scrutinise his face in the darkness, and not dreaming of an indiscretion, rode over his weak negatives, horse and foot, and drew him by force into the garden, and in the hall took his hat away from him and slid his overcoat from his shoulders. Mr. Orgreave, having accomplished a lot of forbidden labour on that Sabbath, was playful in his hospitality. "'Prisoner, take charge of him!' exclaimed Mr. Orgreave shortly, as he pushed Edwin into the breakfast-room and shut the door from the outside. Janet was there, exquisitely welcoming, unconsciously pouring balm from her eyes but he thought she looked graver than usual. Edwin had to enact the part of a man to whom nothing had happened. He had to behave as though his father was the kindest and most reasonable of fathers, as though Hilda wrote fully to him every day, as though he were not even engaged to Hilda. He must talk, and he scarcely knew what he was saying. "'Heard lately from Miss Lesways?' he asked lightly. 
or as likely as he could. It was a splendid effort. Impossible to expect him to start upon the weather or the strike. He did the best he could. Janet's eyes became troubled. Speaking in a low voice, she said with a glance at the door, "'I suppose you've not heard. She's married.' He did not move. Six. Married? Yes. It is rather sudden, isn't it? Janet tried to smile, but she was exceedingly self-conscious. To a Mr. Cannon. She's known him for a very long time, I think. When? Yesterday. I had a note this morning. It's quite a secret yet. I haven't told mother and father. But she asked me to tell you if I saw you. He thought her eyes were compassionate. Mrs. Orgreave came smiling into the room. "'Well, Mr. Ebbin, it seems we only get you in here by main force.' "'Are you quite better, Mrs. Orgreave?' he rose to greet her. He had by some means or other to get out. "'I, I must just run home in a second, he said, after a moment. I, "'I'll be back in three minutes.' But he had no intention of coming back. He would have told any lie in order to be free." In his bedroom, looking at himself in the glass, he could detect on his face no sign whatever of suffering or of agitation. It seemed just an ordinary, mild, unmoved face. And this, too, he had always felt and known would come to pass, that Hilda would not be his. All that romance was unreal. It was not true. It, it had never happened. Such a thing could not happen to such as he was. He could not reflect. When he tried to reflect, the top of his head seemed as though it would fly off. Cannon! She was with Cannon somewhere at that very instant. She had specially asked that he should be told. And indeed, he had been told before even Mr. and Mrs. Orgreave. Cannon! She might at that very instant be in Cannon's arms. It could be said of Edmund that he fully lived that night. Fate had at any rate roused him from the coma which most men call existence. Simple Maggie was upset because, from Edwin's absence and her father's demeanour at supper, she knew that her menfolk had had another terrible discussion. And since her father offered no remark as to it, she guessed that this one must be even more serious than the last. There was one thing that Edwin could not fit into any of his theories of the disaster which had overtaken him, and that was his memory of Hilda's divine gesture as she bent over Mrs. Shushan's on the morning of the centenary. End of Volume 2, Chapter 21